My name is Jeremy Antley, and in this video that you're watching today, I'm going to be talking about a war game that I've been doing some background research on, uh, part of a deeper interest I have that I want to talk about, uh, for Sinai. You can see it here on the front of your screen. Uh, I originally gave this talk, or a version of this talk, I should say, at the Weird Shift uh, micro talks that were held here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, it's been a couple of months. I meant to record this a little bit after I did that talk, but it's it's been a bit, so I've had time to reflect and think and maybe add a few more details that I wasn't able to really go over in the uh, original talk. So I've brought up the uh, PowerPoint slides I brought here. I've added a few since that talk, uh, and I think I would like to go over it and uh, sort of give you a little uh, background on, on why this topic is very interesting to me and why this game, I think, deserves a little bit more study or at least the topics surrounding this game. Um, this is a war game. It was published. It's a Hex Encounter war game. It was published in 1973, uh, late in 73, and as you can see, it covered the Arab-Israeli wars of 56, 67, and yes, the war that did occur as the game was being published, uh, the October War of 1973. It's part of the reason I really want to study this game is because uh, not only is it just an interesting topic and the fact that it was designed uh, around a contemporary conflict is probably the most interesting thing I find about it, but because of the fact that it is a war game that was published on a then contemporary subject, it opens up a lot of interesting angles of exploration to deal with sort of uh, notions of empire, also um, uh, well, as we'll see, I won't spoil it. Let's just kind of get into it, and I think as we go through, you'll you'll follow along, and it'll be fun. So, when I gave the sort of micro shift talks, one of the things I wanted to put in perspective was how Sinai is part of a larger tradition of wargaming, and wargaming um, as we know it sort of begins, sort of modern wargaming. Uh, begins with Kriegspiel, which came about in the early 20th century and, and utilized a table sort of like this. The top part would unfold, you would have various terrain, you could lay down with tiles. Um, military units would have uh, sort of these uh, block symbols you would put on the map, and, and depending on the type of Kriegspiel you played, either one that had uh, strict rules or had a referee, you would move your pieces around uh, and you would either follow the rules to adjudicate damage or movement or you'd utilize the referee to sort of, um, uh, they would use their best judgment as a military expert to, to judge whether your moves were appropriate or not. Uh, it was conceived of as a training tool for officers, uh, especially those that were in training, uh, and it was uh, quickly adopted by the Prussian military, and that's sort of what gave them the edge uh, in a lot of their military conflicts in the 19th century because a lot of militaries at the time were utilizing more... Um, sort of nobles to run their military affairs, which had mixed results because nobles, of course, had a lot of time and money and could train in those things, but of course that didn't mean that they were guaranteed military geniuses either. Uh, and with the rise of increasing centralized bureaucracies and civil services that arose sort of in the modern period, particularly in the 19th century, you had an increasing amount of people coming into government service or being impressed into military affairs and games like Kriegspiel were a great training tool to get uh, junior officers who may not have uh, the sort of pedigree or background or training that's maybe the more noble officers, which again, we, can, we should say we're not guaranteed to be good officers. Um, but this was one of the many ways that the Prussian military was able to utilize, uh, the mil military commanders realized the value of this fairly soon in, in, as a training tool. And as you can see here is a nice little picture of the auto maneuvers officers playing at Kriegspiel or the game of war. and. While it did remain sort of a game of the nobles, it is interesting that this is where we get, begin to see the learning uh, potential impact of war games in the sense that you can be trained from them, sort of what we're talking about. Now, this is all from a professional war games. So these are much more complex games. That's what we're talking about the history of. And the games I'm talking about today are going to be what we call, we think of as a commercial war games. So we have things like what many people are familiar with, probably if you're not a war gamer, is something like Risk. Or maybe you might be more familiar with something like Axis and Allies, a little bit of a step up, more complicated uh, for commercial war games. But the game I'm discussing today goes even beyond sort of uh, what these two popular games are. And we're talking about some, we're talking about commercial war games that can get very detailed and very uh, in depth. And as you can see here with this picture of these two gentlemen here, just proudly displaying their copies of uh, Guderian's Blitzkrieg II and Case Blue. Uh, two games that are part of the Operational Combat series. Uh, just to give you a sense of scale on this picture, each of these little map segments uh, 
you can kind of see where the lines delineate between the segments of the map. Uh, that's what, uh, 32 by 24 inches. Uh, so this is easily, oh man, 10 or more feet, maybe like 8 feet or so of just hex uh, representations of terrain, little counters that represent military units. Uh, this represents almost the entire, I believe, East Front operation, the Operation Barbarossa. It's what Guderian's Blitzkrieg and Case Blue cover. So, and both these games are hundreds of dollars, so you can imagine the sort of time and effort and money that goes into um, these sort of games. It sort of differentiates them from, say, Axis and Allies or Risk. They're just more detailed. They aim to have um, some degree of verisimilitude because they really want to show that um, it's supposed to be a learning tool and a fun game at the same time. You see commercial war games kind of play with this, should I be a game or should I be more of a, a learning simulation? And you definitely get some of that um, tension drawn out in discussions on war games, uh, particularly commercial war games. So if we talk about uh, the hobby of war games, commercial war games, we really are talking about, uh, especially in the beginning and even the period when I discussed Sinai comes out in 73, really is dominated by two companies. Uh, Avalon Hill is probably the first and uh, probably most well known uh, in general gaming circles. It was founded by Charles S. Roberts. He is known as sort of the grandfather or the father of, um, I guess he is the father of modern commercial war gaming. He developed some of the very first commercial war games, which include Tactics, as you can see here, he's got his arm on Tactics and Tactics 2 and, and Gettysburg. Um, Charles S. Roberts is credited with introducing the Hex into commercial war gaming. He sort of picked up on that while touring uh, the RAND facilities. Uh, and he knows that they were using their own um, devised Hex maps to represent terrain for some of their own war game exercises they were conducting for the military. And Charles thought it was a good idea and brought it over to his games. Um, but he's largely credited for getting the hobby started in the first place. The second big player uh, of the early commercial wargaming scene, and particularly of the game we're talking about, Sinai, is of course SPI. And this was founded by James Dunnigan, also known as Jim Dunnigan here at the top. Uh, Jim, uh, Jim's company was uh, interesting in the fact that it produced dozens and dozens of games, and produced many games a year. Uh, of which Sinai was only one, so uh, Avalon Hill had a fairly good production rate as well, but SPI was known for really cranking the games out. And one of the ways they did that is that they utilized their own in-house magazine strategy and tactics as both a way to advertise for the games, to discuss the games, to write articles about the games, but also to solicit feedback from the subscribers as to what games should be published uh, in the coming year, in the coming next quarter. Uh, it was some of the first, uh, if you really think about it, you know, data-driven analytics are, are all the rage today, right? Big data. And it's not that the other companies didn't use it, but that um, Dunnigan was perhaps at the forefront. And uh, several other podcasts have noticed this, that he, he was good about knowing what kind of games he should be making for the audience he had. So you would find sort of these uh, feedback questions in the strategy and tactics, and of course this is the one that Sinai first appeared in, we're gonna talk about that. So there would be a questionnaire in the back, and you can see up the little red rectangle at the bottom. Um, there were something like a dozen or more games you could choose from. Here's what the Sinai one said. Um, is an Arab-Israeli war, so 56, no, it's to 70 at the time. They were going to just stop at 1970. Uh, it's a brigade-level game with numerous special rules to reflect the very special conditions of the situation. Now, what makes Sinai kind of interesting to me, uh, beyond the fact that it did cover a contemporary uh, war, is that it, it's sort of, a, in, a, in a design lineage aspect, is the first of, of a whole new wave of genre of games that depict modern conflicts or hypothetical conflicts. Um, these are now becoming bigger and, and more prevalent in the hobby. It's, uh, if you know anything about war gaming, uh, it tends to be dominated by topics of either the Second World War or Napoleonic campaigns or even ancients. But there is a growing um, a niche of, of modern war games, we might say, and Sinai was definitely at the forefront of that. Now, it wasn't the very first game, at least from my research, to actually depict a uh, commercial hobby war game, I should be very specific, to depict a uh, contemporary conflict. Uh, as you can see here, strategy and tactics number 35, just two issues before the one Sinai would appear in the questionnaire, uh, had the game Year of the Rat by John Prados, and it depict, and, and it covered a conflict in Vietnam, a battle in, the, in Vietnam in 1972. So it wasn't exactly the first, Sinai wasn't the first to do this, but it was at, the, at a new wave of games, a new wave in which Dunnigan was trying to find um, perhaps another marketable niche of games outside of the Second World War, outside of Ancients, outside of Napoleonics.
And that tradition continues today. Here's a copy of Next Order, the cover for Next War India Pakistan, published by GMT Games. I ordered this game. It's now on my bookshelf uh, because I just have an interest in sort of modern war topics and what these games sort of say. And we're going to talk about more about that here. But it goes to show that Sinai is uh, part of a much longer lineage and design history that continues even today. So some things I want to bring in when we think about Sinai is I start looking over some of the materials and um, ludic thinking and sort of design thinking that went into it. I'm reminded of this sort of short story written by, um, I'm going to totally butcher his name, and I should just know this one, right? Uh, the Borges. Uh, um, little paragraph he wrote, right? This is a little story, if you know anything about this story. This is the entire story, it's just a paragraph. And what it describes is sort of a land, a fictional land, in which the art of cartography becomes so perfect that cartographers were making uh, one-to-one maps that would essentially lie, a map of an empire that lies over the entire size of the empire. And eventually it became so dusty and forgotten and people sort of let cartography go that the map would become uh, as you can see here what they say in the deserts of the west till today there are tattered ruins of the map inhabited by animals and beggars in the land there's no relic of the disciplines of geography and the second thing I want to kind of bring in here is a concept that I read in an article by Megan Norcia I believe this is from 2009 uh, it's entitled puzzling empire early puzzles and dissected maps as imperial heuristics and what her thesis essentially was is that she was looking at sort of um, well, well, exactly what it says right here, early puzzles and dissected maps, sort of maps we might think of as like jigsaw puzzle maps that you put together in a frame. And she was looking at what children were playing with, and her argument was is that British children that were being raised in sort of the British Empire that would play with these sort of puzzles that would depict the world or maps of far-flung places such as uh, India, Canada, Australia, that by doing that, um, children were actually learning to engage in the thinking process of what it meant to become a, a citizen of the British Empire, what it sort of meant to be a part of this very larger organization uh, that they might become an administrator of or might just work in. It sort of helped them understand their place in the world and got them sort of mentally prepared for assuming the duties and roles of a citizen of empire. Another uh, sort of academic angle I'm going to bring into the Sinai analysis beyond Megan Norcia's is also sort of the ideas brought in here by uh, Dyer Witherford and Deputer in their Games of Empire. I believe this is also from 2009. I could be wrong on that. Global Capitalism and Video Games. Some really interesting arguments there. They really do talk a lot about sort of the impact of notions of empire, of the impact of... Um, you know, the, the, the famous catchphrase in academia, neoliberal policies, neoliberal thinking. Um, but it clearly only deals with video games. And even though it sort of is taking this neoliberal ideology and tradition and, so, and showing the extrapolation of it in sort of these ideas and notions of empire in modern video games, it'd be interesting in my perspective to look at the contemporary, or look at uh, board games, manual war games, because they share a lot of the same aspects as we're about to see. And particularly with Sinai that is coming out in the 70s, which is sort of the birthplace of the neoliberal ideology that's taking place, or this idea that um, markets or sort of market forces can do more than just regulate um, um, money flows, but also regulate your life or become a sort of informed uh, knowledge, a position of knowledge for people to use to find out all sorts of things, right? I won't go into what neoliberalism is here, but anyway. But it's, it's part of an interesting notion that, that uh, they brought up here in this book, and I want to sort of tease out in sort of the examples from, this, uh, from Sinai. So here's a map of Sinai. It's pretty unique in games that cover the Arab-Israeli wars in that its scope is, is huge. Uh, you can see here we have a map of Israel, we have Egypt uh, on the left there, we have Jordan on the right, and Syria at the top right. Um, it's, it's done in three colors. This was pretty standard production values for SPI games in the 70s, so it looks rather drab. But um, this is actually pretty good. Nice full color. It was mounted here for the designer's edition. And some very interesting things about this map beyond its scale and scope uh, is the fact that it literally, you can't really quite tell because I couldn't get in zoom in here, but the map depicts several different uh, timescapes on it. So because we have different wars, the 56, 67, and 73 wars, um, different things are going to be built at different times. So you can see here, uh, for example, over in Egypt, over here with the uh, Suez Canal area, you'll see the Bar Lev line. That didn't even exist in 56 because, of course, that's uh, the Israelis uh, took this in 67 
and had captured this territory in the Six Day War in 67. 56 was sort of a initial conflict when Israel had just been formed. The Arab states tried to crush it. They didn't do well. Uh, 67 is the war in which it looked like Israel was going to be uh, crushed, but they used a preemptive airstrike attack to just utterly devastate the Arab forces, and they seized the entire uh, Sinai Peninsula there. Uh, it's sort of, if you know of the borders of modern-day Israel and you're not familiar with the history of it, it might surprise you to learn that they basically grabbed so much territory uh, from the Arab states. And indeed, the consequences of the Six-Day War and the, the dramatic victory the Israelis achieved uh, in no small part plays a, a significant role in sort of the conflicts we saw today. Now, I won't go into the history of that, of course, um, but do know that sort of the capturing of the Sinai eventually did lead, especially after the, seven, the failed 73 war, it did lead Anwar Sadat, who was the um, uh, dictator, shall we say, of Egypt, so the, not the ruler, the ruler for life of Egypt. Um, it did lead him, under U.S. pressure, to make amends with Israel and sign the Camp David Peace Accords, in which Israel did uh, cede the Sinai Peninsula back to Egypt in exchange for... Um, various concessions, and also just having peace with Egypt, which is largely maintained and held uh, since then. Anyway, so this is the map of Sinai. And if you remember, we think about this notion of empire and the idea of how playing on a map, of the British children playing with maps or dissected puzzles uh, led them to understand the role of empire. If you think of the American role here, and I sort of have this America's Navy, a global force for good, because of course the Navy has bases everywhere, uh, at least across the world, right? Um, you begin to understand that when you start playing with Sinai, that when you play this, you are engaging, at least as a player, and if you're an American player, you're engaging in some of the same uh, imperial heuristics that Megan Norcia saw. And you're also engaged in some of the, the critiques and understandings of empire that was brought up in the games of empire. Um, in that you understand America's place in the world, you start to understand the conflicts that would drive American interests at that time. Obviously, we were still, uh, were and still are a strong um, uh, ally of Israel, and we have a deep interest in Middle East politics. And at the time, this was the powder keg of the Middle East, which still is, um, looking at sort of conflict. So playing this game as an American citizen would have not only brought you up to speed on some of uh, the notions of what American interests lie in, but also sort of what geopolitical forces we have to keep on top of. Uh, so it's very interesting in that sense, right? So that's kind of why I bring in this America's Navy. Now here's an ad for Sinai that came out in Strategy and Tactics. It did come out in the um, uh, late 73. And as you can see here, it says we have a game for 56, 67, the 73 game, plus a hypothetical late 70s game. So if you remember sort of the initial um, uh, survey question saying, would you like to see a game about this? They really only mentioned the 56, 67, and a 70s war. Well, of course, the 73 war occurs. And interestingly enough, they're able to sort of create a scenario that, that uh, does their best to mimic the results of that war, and they create a hypothetical late 70s game. So he's projecting not only a contemporary conflict, but also using his understandings, uh, or Dun Dunnigan did in sort of his research team, uh, the understandings of their conflict in the 70s and projected what that would look like in a hypothetical conflict in the late 70s. In his... Um, book, uh, The Complete War Games Handbook here, which is a revised edition uh, that I have the cover for. He discusses Sinai as part of his biography of games, uh, or a bibliography of games or whatever. And in 1973, he says here, it's a series of scenarios, operational level on the Arab-Israeli wars. It was finished when the October War broke out, and, and he says it accurately predicted the course uh, of war in the hypothetical 70 war scenario. Um, the value for Dunnigan in this game is that it showed the value of predictive games based on historical trends, which is sort of the thing that modern games or hypothetical war games, uh, this is their main claim to fame. This is what they try to do, is that they use predictive, uh, they use historical trends to make predictive um, sort of guesses of what the future will be. Uh, the really interesting thing about this, of course, is the last sentence. He received research assistance from members of the Israeli UN delegation who were anxious to find out what was going on and how the, and how the war would develop. So even as he's designing this game, and they're putting sort of the, the finishing touches on their scenarios, they're getting intelligence or receiving research assistance, is what he says here, from the Israelis, because they're very interested in seeing during the conflict what's, because at the time, you have to remember, this war was another one of those wars, like the 67 war, in which it looked like the Arab armies were overwhelmingly powerful. And indeed, as we learned in the 73 war, they utilized much better command and control. They had access to much more devastating uh, surface-to-air missile batteries, which gave them uh, not necessarily the edge, but it made uh, Israeli air, air power extremely attritional because you would just lose so much of it. And the Israelis were actually willing to throw away quite a few planes 
uh, to, in, in order to secure the victories they need to get. We won't get into the 73 war, but what's interesting is that is that Israeli uh, members of the UN and probably members of the Israeli intelligence reached out to Dunnigan, got him research assistance to actually to make his game simulation even better because they felt like they could learn something from it uh, to fight their own war. And this is not the first time you see this sort of thinking that happens, but with commercial war games, it's it's not the it may not be the first time that was done because I believe Dunnigan was also and also Charles S. Roberts I believe had contracts with the army to do games training games for the army. Um, but this is one of the few times uh, that you can see that a, a, a specific commercial game had direct impact on sort of how people perceived and could understand the war. And I think that's very interesting. Now, what's really cool to me is how this game has endured. Uh, it was published in 73, but even today there is a small cadre of uh, supporters online who see value in the game and want to update it. They want to make it as accurate as possible uh, because they feel like not many other games sort of cover the same scope and uh, scale of this of this conflict that Sinai does, even though several other games have come out about the Arab-Israeli wars. Um, here we see an updated order of battle that one user on the Consim World Forum, I'll be drawing a lot of my examples from the uh, Consim World Forum. It is one of the largest forums um, in existence for war gamers. It's been one of the longest uh, existing right now, too. So it has a wealth of knowledge. Uh, it, is, it is straight out of the 90s, though. When you look at it, it is more of a stream of consciousness forum. It's not threaded. So it's difficult sometimes to find things, but that also sort of enhances the archival value and the research uh, value of it. So here we have an order of battle that someone has attempted to uh, rectify the order of battle, which is simply, for those who are not into uh, the military war games, is really just a listing of every, uh, you know, the forces used in that battle and sort of what divisions and brigades and companies and all that sort of thing they belong to and what, and what their composition of forces were. Um, so here's one that's attempting to update it, and he's using all sorts of sources. He's The person who created this utilized, uh, and this was done sort of in the uh, mid-2000s, he utilized uh, any newspaper articles he'd get, magazine articles he'd get, uh, military historical books that were written on the battle, biographies from uh, uh, people in the battle on both sides. So you can see here that he's putting together sort of like Megan Norcia's dissected maps or puzzles, is bringing together these various pieces to to put together a more complete picture of a battle for 1973. Also interesting with Sinai are sort of the variants that, that uh, various players come up with in which they utilize sort of the logic of the game, the game logic itself, and they find a way to expand that game logic so that it can incorporate a, a more fuller picture or sometimes just a more fun picture of the battle to be depicted because not every um, sort of suggestion made for alternate rules or something like this like Cubans, not all these were were, you know, um, plausible necessarily, but they just sort of expanded the worldview of the game and, and for some people brought in a, a much needed element of realism. So this one's pretty interesting because it says we know that Cubans have been uh, supportive of you know, revolutionary conflicts, so we could see them sending in some units, and, and he sort of outlines the rules of how you would do that. This one is perhaps my favorite one because it is in Iranian intervention rules for all mid-70s scenarios in which anytime Iraq participates in the war, Iran will send in troops to help Israel. Now, of course, we know that this had to have come out before the Iranian Revolution because there is just no way that we could really see today Iran sending in troops to defend Israel from uh, fellow Arab nations' attacks. But at the time, Iran was a monarchy and it was a, a staunch ally of the U.S. So we can see where this sort of game logic brought in a sort of... Um, a nuanced understanding, well, not even not necessarily nuanced, but just an understanding of how geopolitical forces work there, that if uh, Iraq would uh, be sending forces against Israel, of course, Iran would have an interest in not having Iraq get bigger or more powerful, and it would send a counter uh, force to help out, right? So that's pretty interesting in itself. If we look at some other Consum World Forums, then we can see here at the top one, we have Africans in Sinai. And here's like a, a another um, variant that came out in sort of a... Uh, a magazine, a fanzine, you can say, the Jagged Panther Battlefield number 15 at the time. Uh, I wish I, if anybody has copies, by the way, of the Jagged Panther uh, series, I would be very interested in getting a copy of that. Let me know. But that's sort of a side topic. Uh, here we can see that here's rules outlining how Ugandan forces would come in, or the Ethiopian force house rule, in which it says here, the house rule, uh, when a force from Ethiopia coming to the aid of Israel, since they consider themselves more or less a lost tribe of Israel. So you see some very interesting extensions of logic to even bring in Ethiopians into the Sinai conflict. 
And of course, uh, the second posting down here on the bottom outlines all the different other forces you could or might want to add and sort of provides justifications or what kind of force values those forces would have. Um, again, a really interesting use, and these are all players, and this is some 40 years after the game's been made, right, in the conflict, uh, probably 30 years, right? that these players are debating how would we be able to get, how would you use game logic to understand how something like the North Koreans could get involved in the battle. So here are the original counters that were included with Sinai. Pretty basic stuff. Again, production values, at least compared to today, they look, they look poor. But at the time, this was, uh, this was pretty standard and actually pretty good here. Um, of course, players have, have put their own stamp on this too. One player came in and redid the counters and did sort of a silhouette style because some people do prefer a silhouette style over this sort of NATO symbology that you see here. But of course, NATO symbology is what everybody seems to know. So that's, this is another variant that came up that actually is more detailed than the uh, counters SPI put out because you can see we have sort of the unit designations on the right. They're better color coded, uh, a little more readable also. And even going so far as to creating player aids for the game. So this is what this is a setup chart. So it initially would show you uh, what units go in which hexes. It would also down here the reinforcement track. You could have that all set up. Before this would have been in the rules, and you just would have had to keep them out and reference the rules and sort of pick your counters out. But of course, modern war games have begun to introduce more use of these sort of setup cards. And uh, someone's like, hey, I'm going to make that one for Sinai too. The Next to the Iranian alternate rules, this is my favorite fan-made um, uh, sort of artifact for Sinai. This is a map extension that was made so you could put on the top part of the map, okay? So before I get there, so take a look here. It includes Lebanon, Syria, Damascus. It has the similar defense terrain markings and whatnot. And if you remember sort of the idea that I brought in this Borges map, the idea that they would keep expanding the map, that it became a one-to-one -one projection of the country it was depicting, right? And then you look at, oops, what are you doing? Oops, wrong way. And then you look at here, and you see that there's the Sinai map on the left, and here's the expansion on the right that would go um, on the top right corner of the Sinai map. And you begin to understand that you can take this war game, and in fact, players did take the Sinai war game, and in the same way they would extend the rules and the logic of the war game to incorporate forces uh, from, say, North Korea or Ethiopia or Cuba, right? Players are extending the map, and then in this way they can actually take the game map, and you can technically expand this game map using the same sort of distances and hexes and whatnot and cover the entire globe and have a game that was originally just about the Sinai Peninsula uh, encompass the entire globe if you wanted. And again, we see this idea that playing with puzzles, playing with the map, putting together various uh, logics and ideologies together, this is what the war game logic allows uh, people to do especially one on a contemporary topic in which, well, at the time they didn't know, but later we can reflect and sort of have all the what-ifs brought in. And you can see here, here's the Consum World posting in which Bob Zamuda, who created that, says, hey, you know, here's an extension map I made many years ago. If you print out, it'll work. And then the very next comment says, I like that map. We can add in the Israeli invasion of Lebanon now, or maybe a future conflict. So you can see that as the map expands, you can expand the sort of uh, the terms of the game itself, and the logic the game uses, so that you can have not just sort of the Arab-Israeli wars, but maybe the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, or a future conflict that may even happen later, and you can just use that map and sort of create your own uh, units to put on it to depict, the, to depict the conflict of your choosing. Now what's really interesting about Sinai and why I think it's really more fruitful in a sense for people to be conducting research on Sinai or sort of manual war games in general is that they're still around. It's still being talked about. It's still debated. I bought a copy I have for you know $10. You can get on uh, eBay. They printed tens of thousands of these. Uh, it's sort of a weird... Uh, weird way the war game market works is that the earlier titles, uh, tens of thousands of copies were produced. The economy today for war games is just not the same, so that it's something that might have received 20,000 copies in 1973 might get printed 3,000 copies today. So it's pretty easy to find older war games and to find them very cheaply on the market. And that's, and that's one of the advantages, if you're tr I think, to do this, because one, you, you can find them, it's available, but two, you can still engage with them because they're just literally written objects. I mean, it's, it's a textual artifact, it has material pieces, but if I wanted to play, say, B-1 nuclear bomber on the left or warship here on the right, I would have to go find my Commodore, I'd have to find one that works, I would have to hope that it was in um, good repair, and I would have to hope that the games didn't have any sort of glitches or you know bugs in, in the code itself that you'd have to have a patch or an update for that may have came out or may not have come out later. But you don't see the same kind of communities around B-1 nuclear bomber or warship that you see around Sinai even, which is something really interesting to me about the manual war game. 
And you can see here today, this is someone using their own house-made counters they've made. They've updated the map here. And they can play out any conflict they want. And just as we saw earlier with a guy who said that I can now game out a invasion of Lebanon or any other future war, you really begin to see that this is the value manual war games have to study. Because it's one of my beliefs, of course, that war games are both, especially manual ones, these sort of board war games, are both excellent primary sources and, I mean, they're both excellent secondary sources and primary sources um, for the conflict they depict. Because not only are they great secondary sources in the sense that many war games incorporate research or different assumptions or perspectives that were brought in from, say, reading military doctrine or do documents or news accounts of the battle at the time, but they also become great primary sources because they, ref they, they show the reflection of thinking that contemporary people have on the conflict today. And several of the Consum World comments that come in trying to update the order of battle, trying to create variants that actually have um, logical meaning and can be used in the game, um, these are all examples of how contemporary people, some 30, 40 years removed from the design itself and the conflict itself, are using sources from their own present understanding, their own reflections of the period, and they're imparting that onto the game itself. And they can do that very easily because the game is so easily modifiable. And uh, within the expertise of anybody that can actually read and draw. If you can write some simple things on a piece of paper and if you can read the rules, you can change the parameters of the game itself. So anyway, that is my little talk here on Sinai. We'll go back to the top here. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take any uh, comments. I'm going to put this on YouTube, so feel free to put comments below. Uh, you can also get a hold of me. You see I put my Twitter handle at the bottom right. It's at JSAntley. You can feel free to message me there. Uh, I also have email. It's jantley uh, at gmail.com. So lots of ways to get a hold of me if you're interested. But uh, it's been a fun project, and I would like to see more done with it. But I thought that'd be a fun overview of something that many people probably don't know much about, which is commercial wargaming, and especially Sinai, the 1973 game. So uh, thanks for listening.